You ingrates. You whiny, entitled brats. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about you. You're complaining because what? Because everything is way more expensive now than it used to be? And, and what? Because the economy is sputtering and the government isn't letting you run your business or do your job or even travel if you don't comply with a bunch of extremely burdensome and expensive regulations without even acknowledging the great successes of this administration, without even admitting that gas has dropped 10 cents per gallon this month. Here it is, Buster. Can't deny that. So stop complaining and get used to the new normal. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from Aaron Levitt, who says, the dude beating everyone on the women's swim team reminds me of the Seinfeld episode where Kramer joins a kid's karate class and when questioned by Jerry about it, claimed that it was fair because they're all at the same skill level. Kramer, of course, won every fight in the class and thought he was awesome. That is an apt uh, analogy. You're right. I think that's very similar. The only difference being Seinfeld was a sitcom. And the dude on the Penn's swim team is ostensibly living in reality. (laughs) But our reality has become like an episode of Seinfeld or Always Sunny or something perhaps even more absurd. It just gets you a little tense sometimes. And when when you're feeling a little tense, especially at the office, you got to check out X chair. I've got to give you a massage. That's right, you lucky duck. But I'm not, I'm not going to be doing it with my hands. I don't want to get me too. I don't want anyone to file an HR complaint against me, okay? But I am going to help you get a massage at the office with X Chair. X Chair is incredible. I love it. It is by far the coolest piece of furniture in the entire Daily Wire studios. It's just tremendous. It uh, is this ergonomically designed chair. It's I, I, listen, I don't know anything about science, but it's super duper sciencey, and it just puts you in this great kind of posture. It can warm you up. It can cool you down. It can massage you all at the office. It's incredible. And right now, X Chair's Christmas present to you is that you can save $100 off of your X Chair. You can do that by going to xchairnoles.com. That is xchairnoles.com, the letter X, chair. Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S dot com. X Chair has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 per month. Go to xchairnoles.com and save. That's xchairnoles.com right now. Gas is down 10 cents per gallon. We've been told that the inflation rate is hitting record highs, and we've been told, for instance, that the consumer price inflation rate in the United States is 6.8%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's a a very high number, and that should should really concern everybody because your wealth is just disappearing before your very eyes and you are losing purchasing power. But I am here to tell you, the situation is actually much, much, much worse than that. Even that 6.8% number, even there's another number about wholesale price increases that's closer to 10%, but even those numbers do not come anywhere near representing the scope of the problem. So this is the the largest year-over-year increase in consumer prices since uh, June of 1982, since the early early days of the Reagan administration. Uh, This is the sixth straight month in which inflation remained above 5%, but it's much higher. If you talk about fruits and vegetables, then the prices have gone up 4% year over year. That's pretty high. I was talking to Sean Spicer yesterday, and he was complaining that the price of lemons, he, he's, he loves lemons for whatever reason. He was complaining that the price of lemons has gone way up. Milk, 4.6%. Apparel, 5%. Food, 6.1%. Electricity, 6.5%. Jewelry, 6.7%. Okay, so now we're at that, right around that number where the consumer price inflation is 6.8. What about domestic services? home care, maybe cleaning, maybe those sorts of things. 10.2%. New cars, 11.1%. Furniture and bedding, you need some new sheets for your bed, 11.8%. Now we're just getting into food like meat and chicken and fish is up 13.1% year over year. Hotels, going to be traveling this Christmas. I was just traveling. I just stayed at a hotel. It was much more expensive than usual. 
25.5%. Used cars, so not new, new cars already up very high. Used cars up 31.4%. And then you get to gas. Gas is up 58.1%. Year over year, that's pretty high. Now the gas fell in the last month 10%. Does that, or 10 cents, 10 cents rather, not 10%, 10 cents. Does that make up for the 58.1% increase year over year? I don't think so. Even the numbers we're getting out of the establishment media and the corporate press are hiding the real costs of inflation. So whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Well, if you ask the White House, you ask Jen Psaki, she says it is everyone else's fault. <laughs> it is not the White House's fault. It's not the Biden policies. You, you want someone to blame, blame the, the cattle ranchers. The president thinks the way people across the country, American families, uh, digest inflation is by price increases. And if you look at industry to industry, it's a little different. So, for example, the president, the secretary of agriculture have both spoken to what we've seen as the greed of meat conglomerates. That is an area when where people go to the grocery store and they're trying to buy a pound of meat, two pounds of meat, 10 pounds of meat. Um, it is the prices are higher. That is, in his view, uh, and the view of our Secretary of Agriculture, because of, you could call it corporate greed, sure. You could call it uh, jacking up prices uh, uh, it, during a pandemic. Uh, there are other areas where we've seen increases uh, as because of supply chain issues, and we're seeing those increases around the world as it relates to gas prices, uh, oil supply, and things along those lines. So I would say there's some areas uh, where we have seen uh, corporations uh, benefit, profit from the pandemic, uh, and uh, and certainly the president would agree with that component. It's corporate greed, the meat industry. So meat, meat's only up, what, 13.1%. So can you imagine the, the hotel greed, the used car greed, the gas greed? It's their fault. Stop being so greedy, guys. When, when the, the ranchers and the meat industry are raising their prices, but because their costs are increasing. And so they've got, they've got to, they can't be just losing money, right? They've got to keep making a profit to stay afloat. That's very greedy. When the Biden administration hikes your taxes during a pandemic, during a lockdown, during tough times, that's not greedy. Biden right now is trying to hike your taxes a lot. That's not greedy. That's, that's actually, that's just you paying your fair share. That's actually compassionate of Joe Biden. But when the meat industry raises prices because their costs are going up, that's extremely greedy. When Joe Biden shuts down oil pipelines and raises the price of gas to pay for his ridiculous uh, end of the world uh, climate change agenda, that's compassionate. That's one. That's not greedy. When he charges you a bunch of, when he takes your money to pay for his delusions, that's not greedy. When he takes your money to pay off teacher unions that vote for him, when he takes your money to put out little goodies in the hands of his political donors and his political supporters, that's not greedy. But when some rancher in the middle of America raises prices because he has to because his costs are rising, that it's always someone else's fault, right? It's always somebody else's fault. What happened to shutting down the virus. Do you, do you remember, I'm sure Joe Biden does not, since he doesn't remember what he had for breakfast. Do you remember that during the 2020 campaign, uh, Joe Biden debating Donald Trump, t- the, Trump was nailing Biden, as, all, as a lot of Republicans were saying, you're going to shut down the country. We're the, we're the side of don't shut down the country. You, Biden, are the side of shutting down the country. And Biden said, I'm not going to shut down the country. I'm going to shut down the virus. What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. It's his ineptitude that caused the, vi- caused the country to have to shut down in large part. Why businesses have gone under, why schools are closed, why so many people have lost their living, and why they're concerned. Those other concerns are real. That's why he should have been, instead of in a sand trap in his golf course, he should have been negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats and Republicans about what to do about the acts they were passing for billions of dollars to make sure people had the capacity. So Biden's obviously a little confused about many things, including his history here, because at the beginning of the COVID nonsense, it was Trump and the Republicans who wanted to shut down the border, not the the virtual border with China, wanted to shut down travel with China. And it was Joe Biden who called that hysterical xenophobia and wanted to keep the borders open and still has the borders open uh, on our southern border. It was Donald Trump who wanted to shut that down. 
it was Donald Trump who wanted to keep the country open after the two weeks to slow the spread. And it was Biden and all of the Democrats who wanted to keep the country shut down. And Dr. Fauci and, and the public health bu- bureaucrats, they wanted to keep the whole country shut down. And now, and so Joe Biden in 2020 was trying to weasel out of it. He said, I don't want to shut the country down, even though that's what I've been advocating since the beginning. I just want to shut down the virus. Well, all of that to say the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, has just gone on television to tell you that as we head into year two, we're not shutting the virus down. Shouldn't the messaging be, though, Rochelle, as we sit here, there, because if we're going into year two, people think we're waiting for you to sound the trumpet and say it's all clear. We're not really going to get an all clear, are we? We just have to face the fact that we're going to have to live with this. True? I, I think that that's probably too, true. But what I would say is we have a lot of control and power to do that as we come together, as we get vaccinated, as we do those prevention things that work to protect one another and ourselves and our family. We can bring down the amount of disease in this country and get much faster to that place. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. We're just going to have to live with the virus. We're never, ever ever going to shut it down. And I have to correct the lady who asked the question of Rochelle Walensky. She said, as we head into year two, and that seems like such a long time, right? I think it was supposed to be two weeks to slow the spread. How are we heading into year two? We're not. We're not heading into year two. We're heading into year three. Can you believe that? We're heading into year three. It's already been almost two years. It started in early 2020. They said two weeks to slow the spread. That took all of 2020. And then it took all of 2021. And now they're telling us it's going to keep going on and on and on. And it's everybody else's fault. It's Trump's fault for whatever reason. It's your fault for not wearing the mask. It's your fault for not getting the vaccine. It's your fault for not getting the 15th booster. It's your fault for wanting your political rights back. And oh, the vaccines and the masks and the lockdowns, that doesn't prevent you from going into years and years and years more of this. Well, I don't know, blame the meat industry. You know, it's enough to keep you up at night, but when you want to sleep very well at night, I would strongly recommend you check out Helix. I have to invite you into my bed. I do. I do. And I, it wouldn't literally be my bed. My wife would not like that. Maybe she would like it, frankly. I don't know. Give her, you know, she'd be able to go to her own bed. She'd probably have a nice time. We, well, we would both have to have Helix beds in that case because Helix is phenomenal. And I, what I'm saying is I want you to have your own Helix because you shouldn't be sleeping in a bed that's for somebody else. Okay, you should be sleeping in a bed that is just for you. Helix has a quiz. It takes two minutes to complete. It matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else, even if it's me? Head on over to Helix right now. You're getting the mattress that is the perfect fit for the way you sleep. Whether you sleep, maybe you sleep a little bit hot, maybe you like a firmer mattress, they will t- just tailor it perfectly to your preferences. They've got a 10-year warranty. You can try it out for 100 nights for free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it, but you are going to love it. So head on over right now to helixsleep.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They're offering up to 200 bucks off all mattresses and two free pillows for our listeners. Helixsleep.com slash Knowles, up to $200 off and two free pillows. So the CDC director goes out and says, no, you're not going back to normal. Stop complaining. The White House comes on and says, yeah, your prices are going up, but hey, stop complaining. If you want to complain to somebody, go complain to the, the ranchers in Montana or something. Don't, don't bug me about it. And now Joe Biden has lost it. He's lost his temper. He, he just, he wants you to take the 17th booster shot or whatever, whichever number we're on now. He just, why, why won't you take, oh, because you want your freedom? You want, well, Joe Biden says, if you want your freedom, if you want your regular way of life, That just means you're not a patriot and you got to get over yourself. Everybody talks about freedom and not to have a to have a shot or have a test. Well, guess what? So how about patriotism? How about making sure that you're vaccinated so you do not spread the disease to anybody else? What about that? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Be a patriot, says the guy whose party hates America. (laughs) I'm not being hyperbolic here. They hate America. They protest the American flag. They disrespect the symbol of America. They constantly talk about how America is an evil, rotten country, the worst country in the history of the world, irredeemably corrupted because of the original sin of slavery. And it's racist and bigoted and terrible and xenophobic. And that's, it's the worst country ever. So be a patriot. Why should I be a patriot? You're telling me this country is terrible. So, So I guess I shouldn't be a patriot. Now, of course, 
Biden is not applying particularly rigorous logic these days, but the, the left broadly isn't either. You, you remember Andrew Cuomo back when everyone, everyone on the left was in love with Cuomo and they gave him that big multi-million dollar book deal and people were calling themselves Cuomo sexuals and he was being heralded as the greatest governor ever. And he was speaking at the Democrat National Convention in 2020. Cuomo said, we're America tough. We're America tough and we're going to get together because we're great Americans. But just a few months earlier, he said that America was never that great. A few years earlier, I should be fair. He was talking about, about Donald Trump. Trump said, make America great again. What did Andrew Cuomo say? On camera, he said, America was never that great. But then he totally switches and he says, we're America tough. Well, which is it? Do you love your country? Do you not love your country? For the left, it's just whatever is convenient. And then Biden says, what's the big deal about getting vaccinated? Okay, good. I'm glad that that's your argument. Let's hold you to that argument, that it's not a big deal. So if it's not a big deal to get vaccinated, then it's not a big deal to not get vaccinated, right? What, what's the big deal? The, the libs do this all the time with the gender pronouns. They'll say, Michael, come on, what's the big deal about calling a guy who pretends to be a woman she? What's the big deal? Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad we agree that it's not, it's not a big deal. Okay, good. Then it's not a big deal for me to call him a he. Well, no, it actually, it is. It's a really big deal if you call him a he. Oh, okay. So why is it a big deal? It's a big deal. In the case of the pronouns, it's a big deal because the pronouns carry with it whole premises. If I call a man who's pretending to be a woman, if I call that hulking dude from the Penn's women's swim team, if I call him she, I'm accepting the insane and politically very potent left-wing premise that men can become women and that sex is not real and that human nature is completely changeable. And so I'm not going to do that because I think that's a big deal. And it's the same thing with the vaccine. If you're telling me that some egghead bureaucrat who has been around and in power for seven U- U.S. presidents, he's the highest paid employee of the federal government. If you're telling me that this guy can force 330 million people to take an experimental drug to maybe possibly protect against a virus that does not pose a particularly grave risk to the vast majority of people. And he can just do that based on his own whims and his caprices. That would seem to be a fundamental restructuring of, of the constitutional order. And so I think that's a pretty big deal. That's the big, if you're telling me that the federal government can force you to inject yourself with morally compromised vaccines, that Maybe it is permissible to take the vaccines, but it is still a remote cooperation with evil because all of the vaccines were at least developed, if not also produced, using the stem cells of aborted babies. If you're telling me the government can just force you to do that to to possibly protect against a virus that does not pose a grave threat to the vast majority of people, that seems like a big deal to me. But of course, they think it is a big deal. That's why they're putting all their political capital behind it, just like they think the, the pronouns are a big deal too. And they're gaslighting you, I, even though gas is extremely expensive now, thanks in no small part to Joe Biden, they're gaslighting you into believing it's not a big deal. But of course it is. Speaking of patriotism, Governor Ron DeSantis, once again, doing the right thing. Ron DeSantis sent out a press release yesterday saying that Florida, quote, stands ready to aid the response efforts from all impacted states after those terrible, deadly tornadoes that ripped through a little bit, ripped through Nashville, but really hit mostly in Kentucky. The Florida Division of Emergency Management is coordinating right now with the offices of, quote, the nine affected states to identify resource gaps and offer support as needed, including urban search and rescue teams, ambulance strike teams, and recovery disaster specialists. There are so many aspects to this story and they're all brilliant. Okay. On just on the political, on the electoral politics level, Ron DeSantis yet again is figuring a way to put himself right at the heart of a national news story. Why is a Kentucky tornado putting Ron DeSantis in the national media spotlight? Well, because he's offering to help them. And then other governors are not doing that in a very public way. And so that's putting him there. So if the, if the guy wants to run for president, he's positioning himself very well to do so. But beyond just the electoral politics stuff, it's the right thing to do. And this is going to irritate a certain breed of libertarian. There's there's a certain breed of libertarian who's going to say, this is just DeSantis 
uh, illegitimately using his state resources and his constituents' resources to put himself in the national spotlight. It's a dereliction of duty. For, he should just be focused on the people of Florida. What has Florida to do with Kentucky? What have you to do with me? This is, no, as is a bad use of resources. And no, I, you know, do you know what Florida has to do with Kentucky? They're, they're part of the same country. That's what. And actually, actually, it's a good thing when states help out other states. And not only is that not some irresponsible left-wing big government dereliction of duty, that's the right thing to do because we're countrymen. That's what you want. You want a nation to have some cohesion. The founding fathers thought the nation needed cohesion. We did have national cohesion until very recently. Now we have basically nothing holding us together. America does not have a particular race. There used to be a little bit more racial cohesion, but you know, it was, it was always kind of complicated because there were multiple races here. Uh, we no longer really have religious cohesion at all. Uh, we don't, religion is plummeting in America and there's a lot of religious diversity. Uh, we no longer have linguistic cohesion even. We don't even speak the same language anymore both because of the growth of Spanish as an American language and uh, because the libs just keep changing the meanings of all the words we don't. So we don't have a lot holding us together. We don't even have a love of the same ideals or the same symbols or the same founding fathers or anything. Half the country's tearing down the statues, half the country's spitting on the American flag, and the other half is saluting the flag. Half the country, I suspect, identifies much more with the rainbow flag than they do with the stars and stripes. And so what DeSantis is doing here is he's saying, no, no, we are part of one country. We're going to go, we're going to go help out Kentucky. I love it. I think this is great stuff. It's really smart. It's not only good politics, but it's right. And it gets to a much deeper kind of conservatism than the frivolous, you know, just cut my taxes and leave me alone stuff that we've heard for the past 20 years. Speaking of a more robust conservatism, you're not only seeing it from the conservative Republican governor of Florida, you're seeing a strange leaning into a kind of conservatism coming from pop music. You're seeing it come from someone named Billie Eilish. Now, I'm no expert on Billie Eilish, okay? I've never listened to a Billie Eilish tune. I wouldn't really be able to pick her out of a lineup. But Billie Eilish has just come out and uh, and made a very conservative point. She's come out against porn. As a woman, I think porn is a disgrace. And I used to watch a lot of porn, to be honest. I started watching porn when I was like 11. Wow. And, um, you know, it's, I, I didn't understand why it was a, a bad thing. I thought, I thought that's how you learned how to have sex. And I used to be like the person that would like talk about porn all the time. I'd be like, oh, it's so stupid that anybody would think that porn is bad or f***ed up or, you know, I think it's so cool and it's great and it's and it's. What kind empowering. of porn were you watching? I was an advocate and I, you know, thought I was one of the guys and would talk about it and think it was really cool for, for, for not having a problem with it and not seeing why it was bad. And, you know, I, uh, I think it really destroyed my brain and, um, I feel incredibly devastated that I was exposed to so much porn. Am I listening to the Howard Stern show or the mailbag? On this show, where a lot of young people, mostly men, but occasionally sometimes women, write in and make the same exact point that Billie Billie Eilish is making. It's really, some people recognize that we're living in a strange time and and they're they're changing their views because of that. Like, for instance, your view on your mortgage rate, which is why you got to check out American financing. Mortgage rates remain incredibly low, but that might not be the case forever. Are they going to stay at that level in the new year? We can't be sure, which is why you need to call American financing. Lock into a low rate now and potentially save yourself up to $1,000 a month. That's right, per month. You can even skip your January mortgage payment and possibly February, creating greater savings as we begin a new year. Think of how much that can help and then give American Financing a call. There's no pressure, no obligation, no upfront or hidden fees, just a simple conversation about ways that you can save without restarting your loan. That's right. You can choose any term 10 years and over, so you're not wasting money on years that you don't need. Get a free mortgage review today when you call 800-685-5696. That is 800-685-5696. 
96 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. NMLS 182334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. You know, not only was the Daily Wire the first company in the nation to sue the Biden administration for their unconstitutional mandate, but we are getting closer, closer and closer to our goal of 1 million signatures on our do not comply petition every single day. People are realizing that if we do not actively fight for our freedom and our way of life and our rights and the America that we all know and love, radicals are going to take it from us. New York City, New York City is expanding the vaccine mandate to kids ages five through 11. They're forcing a bunch of kids who statistically have an infinitesimally small chance of serious complications of COVID. They're forcing them to take this experimental drug. We right now have over 878,000 signatures. We need your help to cross that finish line. So please sign the petition at dailywire.com slash do not comply. Then share the petition with all of your friends and family. Send a message to Biden and Fauci and all the rest of those jerks who are trying to take away our way of life. We'll be right back with a lot more. Right-wing retrograde activist um, Billie Eilish is coming out against porn. Is she? No, she's not. She's not a uh, Bible thumper or a reactionary or retrograde or any of these things. She's about as pop, mainstream, lib as it gets. And she's saying that she feels that, that porn destroyed her brain because she like so many people who are in Gen Z and millennials to a lesser degree. Millennials were exposed to porn at a pretty early age too, but uh, less so than, than Gen Z, where basically they're just saturated in it from the moment they're born. She, she says that being exposed to this at a young age and getting addicted to it is destroying her brain. People write into my mailbag all the time, as you have heard on this topic, And they say, I know that I'm supposed to be cool and hip and we're all supposed to be fine with porn and actually pro-porn, but I think it's bad. And maybe we've got to do something about this problem. They're recognizing this because it is true. And they're recognizing that while the way that the, the porn industry and the sexual revolutionaries sold porn is that it's a way to increase your freedom. Don't let the, those old constraints and those old nasty preacher men tell you what to do, man. You know, just, just enjoy your freedom to watch women be degraded. That's how it was sold. And virtually everybody in the culture at some point has given into this temptation or even believed that lie outright. But it turns out it's not true. It doesn't make you free. It actually enslaves you. It gets you addicted to things and it warps your brain. And Billie Eilish was talking about how she got really addicted to this particularly violent kind of porn and it messed up her relationships and it actually does change your brain chemistry. So there are actually physical effects of this as well and obviously extremely corrosive psychological and spiritual effects. And it seems to me the only people who don't get it are the squishy right-wingers. The, the, Hard left understands what this stuff does, porn and drugs and this culture of licentiousness. They know what it does and they are wielding it, actively wielding it to compromise your freedom and change the culture. They write about this. I actually write about them writing about this in my book, Speechless, which makes a great Christmas present, by the way. Number one national bestseller, great gift to give to your friends or family. So the hard left knows about this. The conservatives, the actual conservatives know that. But it's just the, sometimes they're called the lolbertarians. You know, the very unserious, squishy, just you do you types who, who kind of fall on the right. They seem to be the only ones who don't get it. That this is a really powerful thing. And when you legalize all porn, just like if you legalize all drugs, just if you legalize all manner of licentiousness and vice, that's not going to free you. It's going to enslave you and it's going to enslave you to bad dudes on the left. Billie Eilish gets it. You should too. Speaking of licentiousness and creepy sex stuff, Abby Shapiro just got in trouble. Abby Shapiro was not doing anything creepy or not. Abby Shapiro got in trouble for a tweet in which she called out this kind of thing. So Abby, for those of you who don't know, Abby is Ben's sister, obviously friend of ours for many, many years. And Abby has her own channel called Classically Abby, where she advocates for a more traditional, normal kind of lifestyle. So she sent out this tweet, two pictures side by side. One is Nancy Reagan with her family, I guess at the Reagan Ranch, looks like it's at the Reagan Ranch. And one is of Madonna, who is now in her 60s, dressed up like she's a much younger woman doing much 
nastier things than 60-year-old women should be doing. Cla- uh, Abby writes from the Classically Abby account, this is Madonna at 63. This is Nancy Reagan at 64. Trashy living versus classy living. Which version of yourself do you want to be? And she was pilloried for this. The tweet went viral. Uh, Molly Jong Fast, who is a left-wing writer writing in the Daily Beast, said that Abby, classically Abby and her brother Ben, they're just boomers. They're like millennial boomers. Molly, if you criticize Madonna, a boomer, for her boomer lifestyle, you're apparently a boomer. And if you criticize Libs for indulging it, you're apparently a boomer. Of course, the opposite would be true. But, but even just on, then the left were attacking Nancy Reagan. They were pulling up some tabloid BS biography and saying that Nancy Reagan was actually herself promiscuous back in Hollywood, which is, which is not true. There's no evidence of it. There were two actresses by the same name. Nancy Reagan's maiden name is Nancy Davis. There's another actress named Nancy Davis. There's no evidence that Nancy Reagan, the lady who became Nancy Reagan, was ever promiscuous. There is a fair bit of evidence that the other Nancy Davis was, perhaps. And so anyway, they're just getting that wrong. And then the left is, they're making all these sorts of ugly claims about Nancy Reagan. But furthermore, furthermore, anyone who is claiming that they would rather be like Madonna, alone on a bed, dressed up like a hooker, intentionally dressed, she's dressed up like a hooker to be sexually provocative in her 60s, that that's what you want to be rather than having your family around you dressed up like a normal, respectable person on your nice ranch. They're lying to you. That's obviously a lie. If you, if you really think you'd rather be dressed up like a hooker on a bed alone at age 63, rather than standing around your nice family with, you know, everyone who loves you and, you know, dressed normally, then either that is, that is evidence of a disordered will, your will has been so corrupted, maybe by porn or maybe just by a lot of bad ideas and a lot of bad behaviors in your life, or it's just a fatal dose of copium. You are lying to yourself and trying to cope with your own bad views and decisions and, and, uh, and way that you've lived your life. But nobody, I don't think anybody who is in their right mind could look at those two pictures to actually say, no, I really, no, I really do want to be like Madonna. No, you don't. She looks miserable. Okay. And Nancy Reagan looks happy Rel- relatively. This is a tough world. There's always problems. Everybody's got problems, but everyone wants to end up like the picture on the right, not like the picture on the left. Speaking of the sexual revolution, just uh, yesterday, the, the Ari- uh, state of Arizona requested that the United States Supreme Court weigh in on a new pro-life law. So there are these pro-life laws cropping up all over the country. And there are different pro-life laws. The pro-life law in Texas, for instance, is a law that allows people, ordinary citizens of Texas, to sue abortionists and in this way effectively prohibit abortion. The pro-life law in Mississippi bans abortions after 15 weeks. So before viability as defined by the Supreme Court. This law in Arizona bans abortion that is done because of genetic abnormalities. So right now it's very common to, when, when a woman becomes pregnant, the woman and hopefully her husband go into the doctor and they're talking about how excited they are about their little bundle of joy. And you look at a sonogram and at a certain point, the doctor, almost 100% of the time, will say, okay, we're n- now we're just going to screen for some uh, genetic issues. And pro-life people tend to respond to that and say, uh, why? What do you mean? Why are you going to scan for a gen? Oh, well, just because then we'll just decide how to proceed. What, what do you mean decide how to proceed? I guess that one thing you could do if you scan for certain issues, sometimes you can do surgery while the baby's in the womb. And so, okay, that would be one reason. But that's, that's not why most people do it. And that's not what most doctors are thinking of. What they are saying is, well, you know, we're going to screen for Down syndrome. Well, why? Why do I... What, are you not going to operate on the kid and cure the Down syndrome? So why? Well, because then we'll figure out how to proceed. And what they mean is... They're going to do a test to figure out if your kid's retarded. And if your kid's retarded, you're going to kill it. That's what they're saying. And I'm, I'm using blunt language for a reason here. Because we have all these euphemisms. Well, we're going to screen for abnormalities. And then we'll decide if you want to use your, your choice and your reproductive health to continue with the... Pre- no, what you're saying is you think that we should kill retarded people, is what you're saying. And you, you think that it's perfectly normal to do that. And that's what a just and serious society does. But of course, it's only a ghastly and cruel society that would do that. So Arizona, rightly, is passing a law saying, no, 
We shouldn't, we shouldn't kill retarded people or people who have any other sorts of difficulties. Or, and, and it's just wrong to do that and we're not going to do it. And of course, the libs are up in arms about it and it's going to go up to the Supreme Court. This is great. I'm glad this is going to the Supreme Court. I'm glad it's going to the Supreme Court now while the Supreme Court is considering the more important uh, abortion case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. I am for the kitchen sink approach here. The kitchen sink approach meaning I want there to be 7 billion different pro-life laws on the books, all challenging Roe versus Wade, all challenging Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and maybe they're for different reasons, and maybe they've got different arguments and justifications, and maybe they do different things, but the ultimate effect is going to be stop killing babies for whatever reason because they got Down syndrome, because of their sex, because of their race, because of, because the mother just doesn't like them, because the father doesn't like them, because we have this insane cult, whatever the reason. The way that abortion became codified unjustly into U.S. law was the kitchen sink approach. The libs just kept bringing cases for different reasons. They kept inventing new rights in the constitution, and, they, and then they would invent new rights based on those rights. So you'd have a right to an abortion found in the, the emanations and the penumbras of certain provisions. It was just completely made up. But because they threw the kitchen sink in, because they just used everything they had, abortion's been on the books for almost 50 years now. Planned Parenthood v. Casey changes, the, this was the case in 1992, changes the reasoning for why we need to have abortion, why there's a fake constitutional right to abortion from Roe versus Wade in 1973. And yet it doesn't matter. The effect was the same. So I think we should do the same thing. Now's the time. Maybe the court is going to squish. They usually do. But we've ostensibly got six conservative judges. Roe v. Wade is probably the single most egregious decision in the history of the United States. Time to get rid of it. Traditional views of human nature, really basic stuff like babies are babies and boys are not girls, are winning political issues. Uh, The libs have convinced us, they've convinced not us, but they've convinced a lot of squishes that if you stand up and say, don't kill babies, that's going to be a big loser when you're running for office. Oh, you can't, you can't go out and say that you think we shouldn't kill babies because, oh, you're going to lose votes. You're not going to get elected. You've got to take the position that we should be able to kill babies up until nine months in the womb. And then, then that'll be really popular. That's what the people want. There's no evidence of that. Same thing on this, on the sexual identity stuff. If you dare say that men are not really women, you're going to look like a crazy retrograde reactionary. That's such an unpopular view. Don't you, say, don't you deny that there's such a thing as transgenderism and that the soul has nothing to do with the body? Oh, you'll lose. BS, that's a winner. We just won a race in Virginia over this. Transgenderism is probably the number one reason why Glenn Youngkin won his race in Virginia and beat Terry McAuliffe because a dude in a skirt walked into a girl's bathroom and raped a girl in Loudoun County. And then the school covered it up and sent him to another school. And he did basically the same thing again. And parents were outraged over this and voters were outraged and they booted out the Dems. And my further evidence of this is that Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, has just flip-flopped on transgenderism in the right direction. So you recall, there was a bill in South Dakota some months ago that prohibited dudes from playing in the girls' sports leagues. And Christy Nome didn't, didn't want to sign it. She was willing to, to ban dudes from the girls' sports leagues in K-12 through education, but not in college. Now, why? Why is this? It's, it seems like a total political winner to me to ban that. It seems perfectly right and natural and electorally popular. But she said, well, I don't know, we might lose some sporting events. She probably got a call from the NCAA. She probably got a call from some donors who do not reflect the views of the American people or I suspect her constituents. And so she totally squished on it. And that was really unfortunate. Well, now she's gone in the other direction. And I'm glad she flipped. You know, there there are going to be some people who say, well, no, she's, it's not real. There's some trick hidden there in the, I don't know, I've read the text of the bill. It doesn't seem like there's a trick in there. Maybe it is. Or they'll say she's being insincere. She's being disingenuous. Yeah, maybe she is. I don't know. I have no idea if she's being sincere on this issue or not. But I don't really... I don't really care that much. <laughs> the, the people who are saying, well, she's not really, she doesn't really believe it. She's not doing it for the right, right reasons. That's the glass half empty view of what's going on. The glass half full view is, yeah, she flip-flopped, 
to a better position. Good. I want my, I want politicians who hold bad positions to flip flop to better positions. And I don't, I'm not going to attack them for it. I'm glad I'm going to say thanks, or I'm going to say good job. Or, or I'm going to celebrate that some, some politicians who are uh, maybe a little less principled and more likely to just go whichever the, the winds will blow for their personal advantage. I'm glad when the winds are clearly blowing in the direction of what is right, as is obviously the case on this sexual identity stuff. Speaking of sports, there is a new documentary out from ESPN. And this is a documentary on one of the worst hate crimes in American history. This is a documentary about a hate crime almost as bad and almost as real as the attack on Jussie Smollett in downtown Chicago. You remember when the white supremacist, homophobic, gay Nigerian man attacked Jussie Smollett because Chicago is MAGA country. Well, this, this was not quite as serious as that, but it was, it was close. This was the attack on Bubba Wallace. Bubba Wallace is apparently a NASCAR driver. It took place at the Talladega Speedway, and they found a noose hanging in the garage. I bet, you know, we didn't see it, but I bet there were burning crosses everywhere. I bet there was probably a Klan rally happening right outside the garage, right? Is that what happened? Well, if you listen to the trailer for this documentary, that's probably the conclusion you would draw. The most incredible, non-competitive moment in sports I'd ever seen. That moment, I could feel the weight of that moment. And, and I think we all did as we were walking. I get out of the car. I look back. And I was like, holy shit, it's a whole garage. The whole garage. And that's when I lost it. midst of all the turmoil. That was going on in the world with the black and white, the hatred and everything that was going on. The entire NASCAR family rallied behind my son. Wow, just brings a tear to your eye for how much the United States has completely lost its mind. Here is the story being told by that trailer. White supremacy is pervasive. Black men can barely walk out of their homes without being chased down. That's what LeBron James said. And this black NASCAR driver found a noose hanging in his stall from the hate crime. But, but the, the drivers from NASCAR, the whole NASCAR family, they decided to overcome their racism, which is so, so pervasive. And they stood up and they said, no, we don't want to attack you, Bubba. We support you and we oppose all those racists and white supremacists. And <gasps> Bubba was so overwhelmed because, because the default mode in America now is for all these white supremacists to just lynch black guys left and right. That's what's going on constantly. And amid all the turmoil and the hatred of the blacks and the whites, finally, finally, there was a moment of racial unity. None of that happened. It was just a tie to pull the door down. <laughs> it wasn't a noose. It was a little tie to pull the door down. None of it. It had been there for months and months. It had nothing to do with Bubba Wallace. It was just a little tie. Yeah, it was not surprising that all these NASCAR people came out to support Bubba Wallace over this fictional event because there aren't any white supremacists or Klansmen. They're, they're, it's just, it's not real. It's not real. None of this is real. There's no, the racial, the, the only racial turmoil in recent years was when BLM burnt the country down last year. And it wasn't white supremacists doing it. It was BLM and Antifa at the encouragement of leftist politicians, very prominent ones, including the current president and vice president of the United States. And to be as fair as I can to BLM, I'm not talking about the radicals and the, the real leaders and the really vicious people. I'm talking about the regular old idiots who just go along with it. 
They did it in no small part because of the lie being perpetrated by these people, by ESPN and by the liberal establishment, that there's this pervasive problem of white supremacy and that nooses are being left around every black guy's house. None of which is happening. It's just all fake. It's all completely fake. It's not a documentary. It is a fable. It is a legend being told. It is a lie being told as the truth by propagandists. It is a mass psychosis <laughs> that we are watching go on. It is, a, it is a kind of religious ecstasy that you're seeing happen on that track at NASCAR and in the movie and the people being moved to tears because finally there's a solution to this problem that doesn't exist. And, and you know what? I don't even really blame them. One, I don't blame the people who are under the spell of the media. The media are very, very powerful. But I don't even blame the people who are engaging in the, these performances. These performances are religious liturgies. When you go out and you hold hands and you sing about the racial unity, or frankly, even when you go out and loot and burn like BLM did, it is a kind of religious liturgy. And man is a religious being. Okay, And we need some kind of religion because we know that we're not quite at home in this world. We, it's kind of weird that we didn't create ourselves. We just came into being. We know that there are things like beauty and truth and right and wrong and goodness and morality and joy. And we can't make sense of it because those aren't physical things. But we see the physical world. And so we know that there is a spiritual and metaphysical world. But there's no satisfaction to those longings in a world that tells you that, that religion is bogus and Christianity is fake. But we still have that desire. And so we fall into new religions, weird, kooky, racial religions, neo-pagan religions that are divorced from reality, such as the racial narratives going on in our country right now. It is no coincidence that right now, the new study that came out from Pew Research, three in 10 Americans have what they think is no religion. This is up 10 points over the course of 10 years. They say they have no religion. They're calling the secularization, the de-Christianization of America. It's de-Christianization, but these people don't have no religion. They just have a different religion because nobody has no religion because everybody's got to serve somebody. There is a new religion. It's just way weirder and way less true and way more destructive than the old religion we had called Christianity. Who you serving, man? What, what religion are you taking part of and what connection does that have to the real world. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. John Bickley here, Daily Wire Editor-in-Chief. Wake up every morning with our new show, Morning Wire. On today's episode, one of the nation's largest school districts pushes back its vaccine mandate, Elon Musk winning Person of the Year causes a stir, and what exactly is in Build Back Better? Join us and get the facts first on the news you need to know with our show, Morning Wire. 